Judges 9, we'll read from verse 1 through verse 21, with our text being Jotham's fable, which begins in verse 7 and runs almost to the end of our scripture reading. Judges 9, verse 1. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubel, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you either that all the sons of Jerubel, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words. And their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubel, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubel, was left, for he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice, and cried, and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees were went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honour God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and rule over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Why should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit? And go to be promoted over the trees. Then said the trees unto the vine. Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them. Should I leave my wine. Which cheereth God and man. And go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble. Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees. If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jerubel and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone. And have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubal and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech, and devour the men of Shechem, and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem, and from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away, and fled, and went to Beer, and dwelt there, for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved, the coronation of the first king, as it were, in Israel, was a total travesty 
from every point of view. We've heard some of that in the previous three sermons in this series. First of all, the office of king was unauthorized at this time in Israel's history. Secondly, the man installed, namely Abimelech, was a wicked mass murderer who had just slain his 70 half-brothers. Third, his path to the throne was financed by money devoted to Baal worship. And this unholy coronation took place on thrice hallowed ground in the promised land. Remember last week's sermon. The city of Shechem, associated with Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, and Joshua. And apart from Moses, these were possibly the four greatest figures in Israel's history up to this point. And then there was the oak tree, or terebinth at Shechem, associated with Abraham and Jacob and Joshua. And then there was the pillar erected a few decades before by Joshua. And surely, one thinks, there must be some sort of witness against this. But the army of Israel did not march up the valley of Shechem. There was no tribe that staged a sit in protest or any other form of objection. No body of elders lodged an appeal and no prophet appeared on the scene crying, Thus saith the Lord. Instead, there was just one relatively young man, Jotham, the uninvited guest, the banquo at the banquet, so to speak, Gideon's last son. He objects. What form then did his rebuke take? God could have sent a sudden thunderstorm. He did that by times to signal his displeasure. Maybe he could have sent lightning to strike Abimelech down dead. That would have had some sort of effect, surely. What about an earthquake? Or the ground opening up to swallow the chief men at the coronation, as God did in Numbers 16, to stop the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But instead of a miracle, the rebuke came in the form of an oracle, or more precisely, a fable, Jotham's fable. That's the subject of this morning's sermon, Jotham's fable. First, the idea of a fable. Second, the point of the fable, this fable. And third, the application of this fable, both for the present day and the application made by Jotham himself in his own day. Jotham's fable. The idea of a fable, we need to get that straight. What is a fable? The point of this fable and the application of this fable. What then is a fable? A fable is a story, a story that involves animals or plants or sometimes mythical creatures who behave like human beings. A story with animals and plants as if they were human beings or sometimes even satyrs or mythical creatures. It's that sort of story with a moral. A moral or a lesson for people. The moral may be political. Aesop, who first penned a famous book of fables, there was political intent in those. You couldn't speak up dangerous times, so you reiterated fables. Subversive speech, as it were. 
The moral may be religious or simply ethical. Here's a story involving animals or plants who behave and think like human beings with an important ethical lesson for people today. From my childhood, the fable I most remember is the fable of the fox and the crow, one of Aesop's fables. There is a crow and he has cheese in his mouth. And there's a fox who wants the cheese. The raven or crow is up a tree and the fox, who's cunning, starts to butter him up. You're a very fine raven. Look at those lovely black wings that you have. Aren't you just really pretty? And Beth, you can fly really fast. And you know what? I imagine that you can sing. I'm sure you're a lovely singer. Why don't you sing for me? And the raven then opens his mouth to sing and the cheese falls out and the fox gets the cheese. And the moral of the story is don't trust flatterers because ordinarily, if not always, flatterers are trying to get something out of you. The fox, you see, didn't think that the raven had a great voice, what <laughs> raven ever does, or that his wings were lovely, or he is a fast flyer. All he was thinking about was the the cheese. Now the tale told by Jotham is a fable. The characters in the story are trees. All the trees together and four individual trees, taking tree now very broadly. There was an olive tree and a fig tree and a vine and a bramble and the trees behave like human beings they have institutions there's a king who's going to be appointed and we're going to anoint the king and this leads to a moral which has ethical import and political import in a spiritual sense and religious import and even more specifically theological Import. This is a wide-ranging, powerful fable. And this brings us to some of the striking qualities of Jotham's fable, as opposed to all the fabulous literature or fabled literature of the ages that has come down to us. This is actually, our text this morning, the oldest extant fable at least so far as I'm aware and so far as the sources I read. It was delivered, let's say, about 1200 BC. So this fable in our text is, let's say, 3200 years old. And Aesop, who was a slave on the Greek island of Samos, who compiled the fables that he heard, well... He lived in the middle of the 6th century BC, according to Herodotus. So Jotham's fable is over half a millennium older than Aesop. The oldest extant fable. And it is actually the only fable in the Bible. So it's the only inspired fable that we have or that we ever will have. It is also, and for the very same reasons, the most important fable. It's more important than the raven and the fox. Entertaining though the story is, and my guess is that some of the children who've heard it will probably remember this for quite some time. Luther, intriguingly enough, with the Reformation and the setting up of Christian schools, had to recommend and develop in connection with the Christian school teachers, a Christian and Reformed curriculum. And Luther said, Aesop's fables should be in there. They are intriguing. He liked them and he thought they're particularly instructive and useful for children. But this fable in Judges 9 is in the immediate service of the kingdom of God. A theological fable the very best sort. 
But some of you might be saying at this stage, now hold on a minute, our minister is just saying and talking about favorably fables. But doesn't the Bible itself oppose fables? It uses the word fable, but it means something different. 1 Timothy 1 verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Refuse profane and old wives' fables. 1 Timothy 4 verse 7. Those who apostatize, 2 Timothy 4 verse 4, turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Titus 1 verse 14 warns against Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And the Apostle Peter declares, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Now in all five of these New Testament texts, four of which occur in the pastoral epistles, warning especially ministers to him against embracing this sort of nonsense in all five of these new testament texts the word rendered fable is more literally myth avoid myths and a myth is something which claims to have really happened unlike a fable a fable isn't saying there literally were trees and the trees asked one of their number to be a king over them. A myth says, making up some fabulous story, that it really happened. But of course it didn't. It's a lie. In 2 Peter 1 verse 16, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables when we talk to you about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. That's the context. Which is a demonstration of the glory of our Savior, the same glory with which he will return at the last day. We haven't followed cunningly divine fables. We didn't make this up. We're not portraying porkies or lies to you. We were eyewitnesses. We actually saw this. And we're credible. We're speaking the truth. So the Christian church doesn't embrace and even repudiates myths, things that are claimed to be true but which are false. Jotham's fable isn't saying that trees talk. It's not teaching that there was a republic of trees that then decided that it wanted to become a monarchy. And even the children never imagined for a minute that the Bible was saying that trees talk. A fable, that's a literary genre. It's very different from a myth, something that claims to be true, but is actually deceiving people. The idea of a fable here is trees for purpose of information, of exhortation, spoken of as if they were human beings, but everybody knows it's only a story. It's designed to captivate and intrigue the listener, like Christ's parables in order to drive home an important moral and there's nobody here this morning and there's nobody watching us live or later who believes anything to the contrary it's really clear what then is the point of this fable let's start let's state clearly what is not the point of the fable The point is not to focus on the first three trees all by themselves. The olive tree. What's meant by the olive tree here? Who's the olive tree? And then the fig tree. And then the vine. The rabbis reckoned that (coughs) Othniel was the olive tree. And Deborah and Barak were the next two trees. Pure speculation and we're not to take a certain tree for a certain person, never mind if it's somebody different from those three. The three trees are not even to be understood more broadly as noble families in Israel or capable people or more godly people who would have done a better job than Abimelech if they'd appointed kings. 
Instead, we're to think throughout the parable of Abimelech, uh, the fable of Abimelech as the focus for the story. Remember, this fable was delivered on Abimelech's coronation day. Abimelech is Jotham's, the guy who's telling it, is Jotham's half-brother. Abimelech is the central figure in Judges 9. The first three trees and the idea of kingship are only mentioned to underscore Abimelech's sin as the bramble king, which is the theme of this sermon series. And Abimelech, you will note moreover, is the climax of the fable in verses 14 and 15. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, after the three previous trees had rejected the offer of the, the crown, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble, his answer is very different from the three previous trees. He says, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. There's no messing with the bramble. And then, after telling the fable proper, Jotham, in verses 16 through 20, applies the fable to Abimelech. He doesn't mention the other trees. They've served their purpose. What then is the idea of Abimelech as the Bramble King, the theme of this sermon series, and now the focus of this fourth sermon, because the parable deals specifically with this. Abimelech is the Bramble King because he will produce no fruit. That's an important thing about a bramble. Don't, don't think now of, of a, some of those things you see over in Northern Ireland by the hedges, and there's little prickles on them, but they have little, little berries. This sort of a bramble, there's, there's, there's no fruit. The olive produces, the olive tree produces olives, from which you get olive oil, which as the text says, have a purpose towards God. You put olive oil in the meat offering. Think Leviticus chapter 2. And the olive oil is very useful, especially back then, for man to you use olive oil to prepare food. Olive oil is used as the fuel for lamps, and it's used medicinally. You would pour it into a wound, let's say. The fig produces, the fig tree produces figs, which you eat. And the vine produces grapes, from which you can get raisins. But here specifically, where the vine is mentioned for its main purpose in the production of wine. And wine, we're told, <coughs> cheereth God and man, because wine was used in the drink offering which was offered up to God. And of course, wine cheers man because wine is drunk. And olive oil, figs, and wine are probably the three most valuable things produced by the trees of Canaan. And Abimelech, He's no olive tree, he's no vine, he's no fig, he's a bramble. And he was a bramble before he became king. That is, he produced no fruit of any use for anybody or God. And when he was made king, he would produce nothing useful for God or his people. To use language from the fable itself with Abimelech the bramble king there's no fatness no sweetness and no cheer 
completely and utterly useless. No fruit. And not only would Abimelech, the bramble king, produce no fruit, he would provide no shade. The bramble's speech in verse 15 is this. If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. The idea is, you see, that kings were to shade and protect their people. Isaiah 32 speaks of this. Verses 1 and 2 state, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. This is what Jesus Christ, as the great godly king, is. A shade from an oppressive sun, shelter for the people of God. And to a lesser extent, a holy king like Josiah presented this shade and protection for his people in his own generation. But now we have in this passage the bramble king saying, trust in my shade. And if you're out in a storm and it's raining, there are some trees, let's say a chestnut tree with big leaves and you can shelter in there. But, but a bramble, a bramble. Think of a woody bark thing with pricklers on it. That's the last tree you're going to go under because not only might you get pricked, but there's just no shade. And that is, that is Abimelech. No protection from the storm, no cool respite from a mercilessly hot sun. He is the bramble king. And then it gets worse, this bramble king. Instead of providing fruit or shade for his people, which is what a good king should do, Abimelech, he's just going to float about. This is the idea of the Hebrew as one of the quotes from the bulletin mentions, when it says, go to be promoted over the kings. That was the offer to the three previous trees. We don't want to go to be promoted. We don't want to, more literally, float about without any root in the ground. Trees are meant to grow in the soil, to say the obvious. We don't want to be sort of transplanted, hanging in midair, floating around. And the Bimelech, he was floating about because he wasn't rooted in a godly calling. He certainly wasn't rooted in Jesus Christ. Here was a man who was restless and rootless, who didn't know what to be at because he was just pleasing himself in this office. And that's what the rest of this chapter, Judges 9, will say about him no fruit no shade from this useless bramble but even worse than a bramble this is a sort of an uprooted bramble blowing about in the wind and then we come to the truth about brambles that they have thorns and they tear with their thorns the previous chapter, Judges 8, verse 16, describes Abimelech's father after the defeat of the Midianites, chastising the elders of the city of Succoth, who wouldn't succor Gideon and his army, but mocked them as they chased the fleeing enemy. So it was that Gideon and his forces took the elders of the city and the thorns of the wilderness and briars, thorns and briars, and with them Gideon taught or disciplined or chastised the men of Succoth. He beat them with thorns and briars and made them bleed for their unbelief and rebellion against him as God's leader. And there's a famous statement by David regarding 
wicked people in the church. 2 Samuel 23, some of David's last words reflecting on his enemies in Israel. He said, The sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. That's what ungodly and wicked people are in the visible church. They are thorns. And not just thorns to prick the minister or make life uncomfortable, but really wretched, nasty thorns, the sort that Calvin had to deal with in Geneva. But the man that shall touch them, these thorny people in the church who are wicked, unregenerate, ungodly people, they must be fenced or fortified or armed with iron and the staff of a spear to work with these people in the visible church. And they, these thorns shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. Elderly David reflecting on some of the people in his ministry that he had to work with in Israel. Thorns. And the bramble king, he produces no fruit, he provides no shade, he floats about, and he tears and rips and brings blood out of the flesh of the people who get close to him. You say, you know, Pastor, I've read ahead in Judges chapter 9. That's just what he does. Yeah, yeah. And the last thing about the Bramble King, and this was suggested in part by the quote from 2 Samuel 23, is that brambles often see the start of a fire. They're easy to start burning, and they crackle. And Exodus 22, verse 6 indicates a law regarding fire in the civil code of Israel that brambles were notorious for starting a fire. And then if other things would catch a light and create damage would be done. And the bramble in Jotham's parable not only says, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, though he can provide no shade. He goes on to say, if not, let fire come out of the bramble, that's where it starts, and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Big, thick, tall, sturdy trees. And this is what is going to happen, just to give you the heads up, later in this sermon series on Judges 9. And now, what is the application of Jotham's parable for today? Well, it is not, emphatically not, the teaching of one brethren author that I read on this passage. You shake your head and you think, these guys haven't got a clue. He says, you know what the passage teaches? There's no office of pastor in the Christian church. That's, and he spends paragraph after paragraph going on about this. And you say, not only, you know, not only is this false, but oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. This is, where did you get that nonsense from? No office of pastor. That is a teaching elder to use different language. But what the brethren don't admit to you is that though they rage against the office of pastor teacher in the Christian church, which the ascended Christ gives according to Ephesians 4 verse 11, what they don't say is that they're actually, according to their view, isn't the office of elder in the church. They're people that might call elders, but there isn't anything properly understood as an elder. And there's no office of deacon in the Brethren Church either. In other words, though they dress it up as we're against pastors in the church, and then they put it onto the phrase one man ministry, but the pastor is the one who teaches, so he's more visible. But the church is not a one man ministry. There are elders and deacons in office who, as it were, a bit like a chess game, if some of you can understand that, they outrank each other and can do different things. What the brethren hide behind and all of the Anabaptist group is that they actually do not believe, contrary to the New Testament, that there are special offices at all 
That is, they disobey the New Testament teaching regarding special offices. It's an Anabaptist idea that offices, they just can't seem to live with that, though it's biblical. The Bible gives qualifications for offices. 1 Timothy 3, Acts 6, Titus 1. Then certain people are nominated to the office in accordance with the qualifications. Then there is an election, and the Bible speaks of that too, an election of New Testament office bearers in the church. And then there is ordination with the laying on of hands. This is the biblical idea of an office. Qualifications, nominations, elections, ordination. This is the Bible's own teaching. And because of that, it's enshrined creedally in the Belgic Confession and even more detail in the church order that we use, the church order of Dort. And it starts, oh, we're against one man. We don't like one man lording over things. That's not the biblical idea of office. Your real beef is with the New Testament, which the New Testament teaches Christ, the sole king and head of the church, appoints offices, and he qualifies and calls people through the church, looking at qualifications, nominations, elections, and ordinations, the laying on of hands, to fulfill these offices and serve the body as his representatives. What this passage is dealing with is it's not attacking the office of pastor in the New Testament church, or to speak more precisely, any idea of special offices in the body of Christ. The passage is warning against churches that accept clearly unqualified leadership. That's what the passage is against. That's, what it's, that's its point. That's its warning. Think of King Saul. At least Saul was tall. He had something going for him. Think of Absalom, who sought to become king. Well, at least he had a good hairdo. I mean, not that I put any value by any of those things, but you could see how that might influence some people. Well, here's Abimelech. He didn't even have natural qualities. He had nothing going for him whatsoever. Not even outward physical qualifications. But more importantly, the key issue, he was self-evidently wicked. And everybody knew it. Yet they chose him anyway. Sometimes there are people who are ungodly and they act in such a way like a wolf in sheep's clothing to cover up their wickedness. But when you're dealing with a man like Abimelech, who a day or two before has killed his 70 half-brothers. I mean, there couldn't be anybody stupid enough, even in wicked, apostatizing Israel, who realized that this guy is no good. And yet they made him king anyway. The Bramble King. No fruit, providing no shelter, hovering around, rootless, ripping and tearing people with his thorns and He's going to be the source of fire that's going to burn the people who get close to him. And for the New Testament church, it's very easy to see the damage that is done by receiving ungodly or unqualified leaders. What was the Bible's number one statement regarding Jeroboam? He was the man who made Israel sin. And that's what happens when you get a leader of a church who's wicked. He will make the church sin. He'll lead them into bypath, meadow, all sorts of false doctrine and wicked living. That's what they do. The false apostles who taught a false gospel, think Galatians or 2 Corinthians, they take people away from Jesus Christ and those who believe what they teach are damned. Diotrephes, according to second, or sorry, third John, not only loved to have the preeminence in the church, but in connection with that, he rejected John the Apostle. It's not only that he was an arrogant man who wanted to put himself first, but he put out the Apostle John, wouldn't, let, wouldn't receive him, and therefore rejected the gospel of Jesus, and therefore accepted false teachers. 
the atrophies is a lot worse than we would have first realized. And any church which appoints women office bearers or liberal pastors or wealthy, influential men who are carnal as elders or deacons is saying, give us, give us bramble men to rip and tear and burn and no fruit, no protection. That's what we want. You say, surely there aren't people foolish enough to do that. Oh, but there are. Oh, yes, there are. This is actually the majority of churches, very, very widely conceived now, of course, in Christendom. And it's intriguing to me, the arboreal imagery of Abimelech as the bramble king, this language of trees in the Old Testament, a man who should never have got anywhere near kingship in Israel, that Jude 12 speaks about false teachers using very similar imagery. These are, these false teachers, trees whose fruit withereth. No fruit from these false teachers. Without fruit, it goes on to say, secondly, even more clearly, twice dead. And then it says, plucked up by the roots, floating about, not rooted in the ground, just like Judges 9 says. Bramble pastors, bramble elders, bramble deacons, and there isn't even a wee berry from them that you can get in autumn time. Nothing. And Jesus said regarding the man of sin in John 5, I am come in my own name and you don't receive me. But if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. They didn't want the Christ of God. They wanted false teachers, false Christ, and ultimately the Antichrist. And so the Christian church must hear and learn Jotham's fable and take it to heart. There was that day superb acoustics. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, down in the valley, Shechem, 800 feet up, Jotham crying out with a loud voice, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And everybody heard it, even the old men whose hearing was going. It was that good. And the church needs to hear this today. And those who do not heed the moral of Jotham's fable, to go back to 2 Timothy 4, shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. Fables here meaning myths, things that are presented as if they were true, but they're actually lies. O foolish congregation of trees, Jotham would have said to such churches and denominations. And then we turn to Judges 9, verses 16 to 20, Jotham's own application of his fable to the situation at hand that day. He reminds them, in his application, he reminds the people of Shechem of what Gideon, his father, did for Israel. In verse 17, he says, My father fought for you. My father risked his life for you. My father defeated the Midianites and their massive army for you. And he deserved well at your hand. And you know that. But how did you, people of Shechem, how did you treat him? You forgot him. You showed no kindness to his offspring. And you slaughtered his sons. Just as the Pharaoh of the Exodus forgot Joseph, and slaughtered the Jewish male children in Exodus 1. This is what you have done. And you did, O people of Shechem. Now I'm not saying that you were the ones who took sword or axe and went to that one stone where there was sort of a mass production. And then they come and they just chop the heads off or kill them whatever way they did. I'm not saying that you personally were the axe men or swordsmen. 
Abimelech's men did that, I know that. I'm not saying that you ordered it either. The Bramble King, he ordered it. But you paid for it. And you knew fine well what he was going to use that money for. And you acquiesced in it. Even to the point that after he did it, you brought him up here to Shechem, up to this famous tree and the pillar, and proceeded in another travesty to crown this man as king of Israel. You did it. And now, having brought his point home and even pricked the consciences of these wicked, wicked men of Shechem, he tells them, and it's dripping with a sort of a holy irony, and now he said, what you should do, if you think you did the right thing by my father and by his 70 sons, you know what the two of you, you, two of you should do, the king and the people of Shechem? You should engage in mutual rejoicing. Be glad in the depths of your heart. Verse 19, if ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubal, and you know fine well that you didn't. Well then, if you dealt, dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubal and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. Pure gladness and joy in each other as so fit for each other. But if on the other hand you realize that what you did was desperately wicked, then you should realize that you will, the pair of you, you two parties, you will endure mutual destruction. If not, verse 20 continues, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. Rejoice in each other if you've done right and well by Gideon. Or may the two of you burn each other up. Bramble king and trees. And then of course he flees for his life. This is what we have in the appointment of a very obviously wicked person to office in the church. We have, to use a phrase of an earlier generation, mutually assured destruction. And the rest of the chapter is going to show how that worked out in Judges 9. And this is what wicked church leaders and their people will get. The wicked church leader will corrupt and defile the people, making them worse in their sins. And they, of course, will have an evil influence on him. And they will see each other damned. It won't be as graphic and vivid always as Judges 9. But the result is exactly the same. And that phrase, Bramble King, you see, needs to be understood too in the light of the Bible's wider teaching. Brambles are, of course, think back to Genesis chapter 3. Brambles are, of course, a fruit of sin part of God's curse upon the world. In Hebrews 6 verse 8 even states, that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And there's talking about those who apostatize from the gospel, like land that bears thorns and briars, rejected, nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And Josh, Judges 9 ends with this sort of summary statement. After all the parties are slain, all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeribah. The curse. The fable carried a curse. And in closing, the gospel for us and our children this morning with regard to wood is that we're not following some bramble, some bramble king today. But we remember the good, solid wood, as it were, of our Savior's cross. And we behold our king as the king of the kingdom of heaven. All of its true citizens. A righteous, just and holy king who provides fruit 
and shelter for all of his citizens. A rock in a weary land. And we know that our Savior bore for us the curse of our sins on the cross, dying for our transgressions and now reigning for our salvation. And we rest in him. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the riches of the Old Testament, for the unity of sacred scripture, and for the security we have under the reign of Jesus Christ in accordance with scripture. Keep us, Lord God, from evil office bearers. Cause us, Lord God, to seek thy Son and provide for us here for our peace and salvation and those of our children and grandchildren, men who will govern us according to the word of God so that we may bring forth much fruit and live in peace and comfort. For Christ's sake, amen.